go. So today, I'm sorry, I'm going to talk about Donald Trump. But first, I'll start with the uh, letter exchange between Freud and Parenthi. So, in one of their early correspondences, Freud invites Ferenzi to join him and his family on vacation. Ferenzi happily agrees, but then Freud forewarns, and this is what he writes. You are welcome at any time, whether you spend the weeks of your vacation in Berkscotty, or whether you want to spend part of the time on the trip with me. It is understood at the outset that you will not disturb me in my work, and that I will not have to take any precautions against you. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best forensic. They're sending criminals, they're bringing crime, they're rapists, and some, I assume, are good people. So, now the Republican nominee for president, many are wondering how Donald Trump has only gotten more popular. On the surface, it's called the Trump effect, an effect which seemingly flies in the face of one of, one of Western civilization's most fundamental moral dictums, the commandment to love the neighbor. Maybe the element of truth behind all this, as Freud says, is that men are not gentle creatures who want to be loved. And perhaps some of Lacan's considerations on neighborly love from the ethics of psychoanalysis can shed light on how a presidential nominee only gets more popular by calling an entire people rapists, why fundamentalists want to believe that all Arab refugees are sex criminals, and how white results in mom can so easily turn Black Lives Matter into All Lives Matter. Maybe neighborly love shares a deeper relationship with the Trump effect than appears on first glance, and perhaps love may index a deeper aggressiveness. In civilization and its discontents, Freud establishes the requisites of civilization, the first of which is justice, and the last is sacrifice of instincts. In order for these aims to be fulfilled, a restriction upon sexual life is unavoidable. The price of civilization is neurosis. But within this antagonism of sexuality resides some disturbing factor which we have not yet discovered. Freud goes on to say that the clue to this yet undiscovered factor lies in the moral commandment to love the name. Within this moral dictum, Freud finds the strongest defense against human aggressiveness. In other words, the dictum to love the neighbor is a moral overcompensation for an irreducible aggressiveness, while Eros binds us together, Thanatos rips us apart, homo homini lupus. Then in group psychology, Freud details how um, what may be a prototype of the Trump effect. Aggressiveness is most readily redirected against proximate rivals who, oddly enough, share a great deal with one another. This redirected aggression helps bond group members together through identification, and Freud writes that almost every intimate emotional relationship between two people, which lasts for some time, contains a sediment of feelings of aversion and hostility. Could this narcissism of minor differences be what fuels the Trump effect? This would require there to be a multitude of similarities between Trump supporters and their detested neighbors. And intuitively, this does not seem to be the case, since the targets of the Trump effect are more like stereotypes and not really existing people. Apparently, the Trump effect relies less on a narcissism of minor differences than a phantasmatic creation. So, while Freud's clue to culture's aversions, aversions to sexuality resided in the commandment to love the neighbor, perhaps our clue to the workings of the Trump effect will reside in the relation of law to fantasy. So, could the Trump effect be a sort of social fantasy of fullness? Trump's doctrine solicits something like a fantasy of fullness by eschewing the refugee, the immigrant, the Muslim, Obama, in favor of the so-called silent majority. I think uh, it's curious to point out here that in um, Trump's dramatis personae, a figure that's curiously missing is the native. And I think that this might perhaps index something special about the status of the native in the American imagination. So, in any case, Trump's slogan, make Freud great, oh, excuse me, make America great again. Um, that's Paul's joke, sorry. Um, it solicits a pleasure dependent upon the alienation of others. And this fantasy provides the pleasure that is characteristic of desire, making pleasurable the effacement of others, different, black, Mexican, refugee, Muslim, etc. Recall how it is the negation enunciated by the name of the father which founds enjoyment, the father's paternal castration threat outlawing incest, relegating it to fantasy. Law, therefore, is the structural condition of jouissance. Law makes its infraction enjoyable. If America, make America great again is indeed a social fantasy soliciting a pathological jouissance based on the effacement of difference, 
then the enjoyment it prefers must have been instantiated by an initial law. Perhaps our clue to unearthing this interdiction lies, as it did with Freud, in the commandment to love the neighbor. The commandment to love the neighbor must serve a proxy as a condition of its own enjoyable transgression. And to explain this paradox, Lacan echoes Paul from Romans, um, if it had not been for the law, it would not have known sin. Sin is only sin after the law says so. Thus invoking Paul, Lacan inverts the relationship between law and transgression in order to draw haphazard identification between them. In a very important way, prohibition and repressed desire are two sides of the same coin. Freud theorized that culture was bound together through new, new libidinal ties formed after repression, such as strong identifications, summoning up aim inhibited libido so as to strengthen the communal bond. Lacan now adds that these identifications are supplemented from without by the transgressive spaces of our fantasies. But what happens if this relationship is extrapolated to the level of culture? Civilization is libidinally bound not merely by repressed individual aggressiveness, as Freud said, but also by an extimate social fantasy beyond culture's repressive cult's constellations. This social fantasy galvanizes a social jouissance. In terms of keeping up with the Joneses, the jouissance I fear in my neighbor refers to that extimate thing around which my desire circles as well. My fear of Trump's Mexican rapist signifies the Mexican rapist inside me, extimate to me. Lacan says that my neighbor possesses all the evil Freud speaks about, but it is no different from the evil I retreat from in myself. Freud understood that neighborly love was indicative of innate human aggressiveness. Lacan takes it as an imaginary misrecognition of the evil jouissance we fear in the other since it is within ourselves. The imaginary deceives, and thus my neighborly love also deceives, hiding from myself that extimate evil jouissance it relies upon. In David Lynch's Blue Velvet, the opening montage shows idyllic images of suburban America and neighborly love, roses, white picket fences, children crossing the street, waiting firefighters. But then the camera slowly tunnels underground, revealing a subterranean mycelium of insects and dirt. Could neighborly love then truly be founded on evil? Is this the root of the Trump effect? The, this foundational evil brings to light some of Lacan's clinical remarks, specifically how wanting how Wanting what is good for the analyzan may indeed solicit itself with good intentions, but in fact only serves to obstruct a, the analysis. Desiring what is good for an analyzan results in problematic countertransferences, which culminate in the analyst identifying with the analyzan, thereby colluding with the analyzan's ego against the repressed desire. What I want is the good of the other, Lacan says, provided that it remain in the image of my own. By extension, the day-to-day -day imaginary neighborly love yields a similar misrecognition since it conceals innate human aggressiveness, as well as the extimate, jouissance and gorge fantasy it relies upon from without. Were one to actually uphold the commandment to love the neighbor, were one to truly and intimately love the different other, one would necessarily do so according to their own deceptive and orthopedic self-image, which could only result in an expungement of the other's jouissance. In this vein, Lacan underscores that to love one's neighbor may be the cruelest of choices. The thought here is that my neighbor may enjoy so long as they reflect my jouissance. Today, this very logic is operative in Norway, where sex education classes are offered on a voluntary basis to Sudanese migrants so as to help them adjust to European sex culture. Legislators in Denmark are already vying to make classes such as these mandatory for incoming refugees. Clearly, there are limits to neighborly love. But the radical thesis Lacan expounds is that loving one's neighbor is not obstructed by xenophobia, but rather that xenophobia is neighborly love's normative condition. Underneath neighborly love is evil jouissance, just as in blue velvet. Ironically, the Trump effect, then, is what we ought to expect from a culture enshrining neighborly love. As stated above, the Trump effect cannot be a narcissism of minor differences, since it is not redirecting repressed libido against similar group rival members. Instead, the targets of the Trump effect are phantasmatic aberrations full-blown, libidinally charged, xenophobic nightmares. Neutralizing the nightmare of the sex criminal refugee, Trump deploys the fantasy of making America great again. And within this fantasy, Trump intends to bring America closer to the good through the elimination of difference. But, as was previously elaborated, the demand for the good is never just that. This demand belies a hidden sexual reality. Every ethical demand for the good is, in the end, a desire for enjoyment. This suggests a paradox of liberal democracy and liberal democratic tolerance, ossified in the commandment to love the neighbor. 
the more we tolerate and love our neighbor, the more we, we rigidify the tumultuous jalousance, as Lacan calls it in seminar 20. Freud taught that the commandment to love the neighbor hides a deeper, more horrific condition of humanity. Lacan added that the resentment we house against our law-breaking neighbor is a structural residue of our integration into culture. For Freud, the cost of culture was neurosis. For Lacan, one becomes a social subject at the expense of the other's resonance. For Freud, culture had a price. For Lacan, culture reimburses you with resonance. To confront the Trump effect, then, would be to confront the fact that my neighbor's resonance, his harmful, malignant resonance, is that which poses a problem for my love. The neighbor's resonance, of which I am jealous, is what problematizes my love and engorges my hatred. The Islamic militant, the Syrian sex criminal, the Mexican rapist, are all fantasies siphoning the resonance within ourselves left over from the integration into settler <coughs> democracy. The Trump effect is our own creation, Frankenstein, indexing our repressed social desires. In the day we love the neighbor, at night we dream of collecting their scalp. They are one and the same. The key to undermining the Trump effect, then, must lie not in stretching our love further, but in scrutinizing our own extimentary sons mirrored within us. Accelerating multiculturalism and liberal tolerance would only further entrench and repress hatred, and that which is repressed returns from without. The problem, as I'm expounding it, is that the commandment to love one's neighbor goes hand in hand with the Trump effect. It might even be said that the Trump effect is a symptom of neighborly love. Yes, Donald Trump is a bigot, but a bigot signifying our shared responsibility to take an ethical stance in regards to the Jusons underpinning our settler society and the vain facade of neighborly love. Love cannot be, therefore, the answer to Trump. Thank you.